I'm Billy Hoffman from Rigor. On this edition of Web Perfectionist, we're going to take a look at strategies to implement caching for API calls. So in our last video, we actually looked at Granger, which is an industrial supply e-commerce site. It's actually fairly large. It's a Fortune 500 company. Um, and what we found is that it's a traditional e-com site, but it loads in these data tables, kind of describing all the different specs and sort of sub-models of a particular class of product. And it pulls these in via API call um, through Ajax uh, from JavaScript. Um, and so what that means is if you come over here, we actually can see it makes three requests and it's pulling in the data tables for these different um, products. If we click in here, we can see the response. We see that's just a big JSON blob and that's what's powering this data table. Now, the challenge here is, is that they're not caching it. There are no caching headers here. So what this means is, is that if I were to refresh this page or visit this page again, which is very common when you're browsing around e-comm sites, my browser has to fetch those data tables a second time. Well, this is silly. This data hasn't changed. Why are you having to fetch it again? We have a whole class of optimizations. You know, we, we're probably caching this image of a, you know, V-belt, whatever that is, for a far future time. Because if you don't have to request and then download an asset over and over and over again, it actually improves performance. And the cool thing is, is that you should totally do this for APIs. And we can see that actually, uh, as we sort this data table up and down, it actually initiates more Ajax calls. So even though I've now sorted this thing, here it is, um, sort order is descending and then ascending. When I clicked it and I'm back to descending, it fetched the item again, or fetched the, the uh, uh, JSON again. And we see the size is the same. We're just getting the same data over and over again. Also a very common practice that someone would do. So how can we avoid these performance problems of talking to APIs? Well, it turns out there's two strategies I wanna talk about today. So the first one is just straight pure caching. You know, I don't know a lot about industrial supply, but I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that the, you know, thickness, number of ribs, and uh, outside length of an industrial belt probably isn't changing on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. So this information, much as if it were a, um, like an image or a CSS file, you can just go ahead and cache it especially if there's no kind of application state or authentication information. I'm, I mean, I'm not logged into Granger. So think, consider when you're returning data from an API call, can I just cache this? Can I cache it for one minute, five minutes, an hour? You know, if you've got a news site or a media site and you're loading what the top news stories are or the top five most recent comments on a news article, it's probably okay to cache that. Um, doesn't have to be up to the minute in real time. So just consider straight caching with a short time to live, you know, uh, and it'll really just depend on what the API is, the, or the nature of the data. The other thing to consider is a conditional request. Now, usually we want to avoid these. Um, in fact, far future caching is trying to do that, like don't make a request, because typically what we find is the latency of going to a server and then getting a response that basically is just a 304 not modified, you can use the thing you already had cached. That's so it takes so long to do that, it takes actually almost as much time as just re-downloading the whole resource again. Um, with APIs, that tends to be less true because instead of just getting a static file, your request to the API server is probably initiating maybe some database lookups. At the very least, you're accessing probably a data cache on the server side to get the data. So there's more server side work involved. Um, so being able to just have the server go, oh wait, I don't have to do that work. The thing you have is okay. That's actually pretty good. Um, and conditional API requests, usually there's some you could return when somebody makes a request, you could return a last modified that said, hey, here is the pricing data for that you know industrial belt. And by the way, the table, it was last modified on this time. So that the next time the user visits the page, they make a request and they basically say, hey, I've got the JSON to build the data table for the industrial belt. Um, my version was last modified here. Is it cool for me to keep using that? And the server can respond yes. Now, if you have an API that maybe doesn't lend itself to like time date stamps or freshness, so to speak, on the data, you actually can use e-tags. So e-tags are kind of like a user-defined way of being able to do conditional requests. And they're super great. You actually can map them almost to like internal IDs and revision numbers and database information and kind of build your own key should that be what you want. 
Um, but those are basically the two optimizations you absolutely can make when doing API calls, whether it's from a mobile app or uh, JavaScript in a web app. Um, con consider, can I just straight cache this data? Even if it's for just a couple of minutes, uh, it could have an enormous impact because someone's interacting with that data element uh, and not needing to make those requests. The second one is, okay, maybe you want to give them some data, but you want some control to make sure the server keeps, the client keeps checking with you to make sure the data is fresh. Well, that's where conditional requests come in. So go ahead and explore options of being able to add a last modified tag or even an e tag to your API responses. Both of these approaches are great ways to optimize the performance of your APIs.